In this recording, we're going to look at uh, how you can cause an equilibrium to shift in either direction, to make more reactants or to make products. So far, we've just been looking at systems that are at equilibrium and making predictions about those. Um, but you can force an equilibrium to go in one direction or another by adding or taking away reactants and products. And that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so uh, when a system is not at equilibrium, the equilibrium expression can be used how to predict how it can get to equilibrium. We haven't done this so far. This is what we're about to learn. So we can use the equilibrium expression to predict whether the system is going to shift to the left. That would mean that it would use up some products and produce more reactants. That would be the reverse reaction. Or if it's going to shift to the right, um, that would be the forward reaction, using up some reactants and producing more products. So we're going to use the dissolution of sodium chloride as our um, first example. Um, we've got our sodium chloride solid. Uh, it's dissolving into silver ions and chloride ions. And the KSP for sodium uh, for silver chloride is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10. So you can tell from that number that silver chloride is not particularly soluble. All right, so let's consider a situation in which we've got two solutions, uh, and when we mix them, we get a solution that has 0.02 molar silver ions and 0.4 molar chloride ions. And the question is, what is this system going to do? First of all, is the system at equilibrium? And if not, what can it do to get to equilibrium? Uh, as with any equilibrium problem, the first thing that we do is write the equilibrium expression. So for this one, it's a KSP and our products are silver ion and chloride ion. Okay, and what we're going to do is we have a concentration value for silver. We know that the silver ion concentration equals 0.02 mole. And we know that the chloride ion concentration equals 0.4 mole. And what we're going to do is substitute those values, even though we're not at equilibrium, probably not at equilibrium, we're going to substitute those values into the KSP expression and see what we get. So uh, we're going to go, the concentration of silver is 0.02, and the concentration of chloride is 0.4. Um, the KSP expression tells us to multiply those two things together, so that's what I'm doing here. Uh, and when you do that, you will get a value of 0.008, or if you write it in scientific notation, that's 8 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay, now this value, 8 times 10 to the minus 3, is clearly different to the KSP, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10. That immediately tells us that this system is not at equilibrium. Because if it were at equilibrium, those two concentrations should multiply together to give the KSP. That's sort of how we define the equilibrium. So this value here that we just evaluated, we can't call it KSP because it's not. Instead, we call it Q, and its proper name is the reaction quotient. Okay, so the reaction quotient, as we've just done, to find the reaction quotient for any particular system, you substitute the current concentrations of reactants and products, whatever they are, whether or not you're at equilibrium, into the equilibrium expression, and you evaluate it. And you can use this value, Q. Um, it's a measure of the reactant or product concentrations when the system is not at equilibrium. And by comparing Q with KSP or KEQ or whatever type of equilibrium constant you're using, you can tell which way the equilibrium is going to shift. So, if Q is greater than KSP, and this is the situation that we just had, so let me just rewrite. We had, um, we had KSP was the concentration of silver times the concentration of chloride, and the value of that was 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10. When we evaluated Q, it was 0.02 which gave us 0.008. So in our case, Q is greater than KSP. What this means, the, the uh, significance of this is 
if Q is greater than Ksp, it means that the concentration of our products, the dissolved ions, must be too high. So to get to equilibrium, you need to reduce the amount of products. And the way that this particular system can do that, or if, if any Q is greater than Ksp, the way that the system can uh, get back to Ksp is by shifting to the left, by more of the reverse reaction happening, using up some of the products, therefore lowering the value of Q until it gets to, uh, to equal Ksp or Keq. The other possible situation is that Q is less than Ksp. And for this to happen, it must mean that there is uh, too little products. So the concentration of products is too low, and that's giving you a value lower than Ksp. If this is the case, the way that the system gets to equilibrium is by producing more products until uh, it gets to equilibrium, until those concentrations multiply to give Ksp. We call this shifting to the right. So more of the reverse reaction means shifting to the left and more of the forward reaction is shifting to the right. So let's look uh, more closely at what possibilities we've got with our dissolution of sodium chloride. So this graph represents the concentration of silver ions and chloride ions in a mixture of silver ions and chloride ions. Um, the notation here is exponential, so it's the way that Excel represents scientific notation. Um, 3e minus 4 like this means 3 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, we're in moles per litre because it's a concentration. Um, so all of these numbers you just read off as exponentials. 2e minus 4 would be 2 times 10 to the minus 4. 5e minus 6 would be 5 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay. Our x-axis is chloride concentration, our y-axis is silver iron concentration, and the blue line with the dots on it here represents combinations of concentrations that when you substitute them into the equilibrium expression, they give you exactly Ksp. So for instance, uh, this dot here, I've, uh, I've rather stupidly made the scales on the x and y-axis different, there's no reason for them to be different. This uh, dot here represents the situation where you have equal concentrations of silver and chloride, that is where they are both uh, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. When you multiply 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5 by itself, you get 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10, which is our Ksp. Um, similarly, if you look at this point here, the chloride concentration is 5 times 10 to the minus 6. It's a bit hard to read on the scale, but the um, silver concentration is 3.4 times 10 to the minus 5. If you multiply those two values together, you also get 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10. So every point on this dotted blue line is a possible combination that could be at equilibrium because the product of the concentrations is the Ksp. All right, now let's have a look at another possibility. Say we've got a system that is, let me just change colors. So we've got a system that's over here. Okay, let's call this point A. So our concentration of chloride is one times 10 to the minus five. And our concentration of silver is 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. Okay, now if we evaluate Q, so we stick those concentrations into the equilibrium concentra uh, into the equilibrium expression. So it's silver times chloride, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4 times 1 times 10 to the minus 5. That gives us a value of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 9. Now you can see that this value here, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 9, is greater than Ksp. So we have a situation where Q is greater than Ksp. That means we have too much product. Our concentration of products is too high to be at equilibrium. So all of uh, this area here in the graph is a situation where Q is greater than Ksp. That means there's too many products, too many dissolved ions, 
And how can the reaction get rid of those excess dissolved ions? Well, it shifts to the left. It uses up some of the dissolved ions to produce precipitate. So if for a reaction like this, where it's a dissolution reaction, if Q is greater than Ksp, the way the system regains equilibrium is for the excess products, the excess dissolved ions, to precipitate out as solid. At some point, the concentration of silver and chloride will be reduced sufficiently that you'll get back to being somewhere on the, the dotty blue line, and then you'll have equilibrium. All right, let's look at another possibility. Another possibility would be to have, uh, let's take a situation about here, say. Um, B. And B, we let's say we've got a concentration of uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 moles per litre of chloride. And 5 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per litre of silver. We evaluate Q by sticking those into the equilibrium expression. And we get a value of 1 times 10 to the 10. And you can see this is slightly lower than the Ksp of 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10. So in this case, our Q is less than Ksp. This means that we don't have enough products. Our concentration of products is too low. So the way that the system regains equilibrium is to dissolve some of the solid to produce more dissolved ions, to produce more products. So let's do an example problem. The, um, the example I've given you so far has been dissolution equilibria, but this works just as well for uh, chemical reactions as opposed to just uh, physical equilibria. So let's take this one. We've used it in several of our examples before. The equilibrium that hydrogen gas and iodine gas form with hydrogen iodide. Um, we're told that the Kq for this reaction at 80 degrees, it doesn't really matter what the temperature is as long as it's not changing. Remember that the only thing that can change the equilibrium constant for a given reaction is temperature. So the Keq at this temperature is 45.9. Uh, and we're told that in a 3 litre flask, we have 3.2 moles of hydrogen, 0.6 moles of iodine, and 2.1 moles of hydrogen iodide gas. They're put into that flask. And we have to predict which way the reaction is going to have to shift to reach equilibrium. So uh, the first thing I would do would be to write the equilibrium expression. That's always a good place to start. So Keq, products over reactants. Our product is hydrogen iodide. And it has a stoichiometric coefficient of 2, so I'm raising it to the power of 2. Our reactants are hydrogen and iodine. And they go on the bottom. Okay, so there's our equilibrium expression. The second thing I would do is to work out the concentrations of each of the species. I've given you moles and the volume of the flask, but not the actual concentrations. So uh, we've got hydrogen, concentration of hydrogen equals moles over volume, so 3.2 moles over a volume of 3 litres, uh, which gives you a concentration of about 1.1 moles per litre. Um, our iodine is 0.6 over 3, so that's 0.2 moles per litre. And our hydrogen iodide is 2.1 over 3, which is 0.7 moles per litre. Okay, to work out which way the reaction is going to shift, we have to evaluate Q so that we can compare it to Keq. So we evaluate Q by simply sticking these values into the equilibrium expression and seeing how it turns out. So our Q is going to be concentration of hydrogen iodide squared, so that's uh, 0.7 squared. over the concentration of hydrogen times the concentration of iodine. So that's 1.1 times 0.2. And if you evaluate that, you get a value of Q of 2.2. 2. 
Okay, so clearly in this case our Q being 2.2 is less than our KEQ, which was 45.9. Now, let's have a look at the equilibrium expression. If Q is less than KEQ, okay, if the values that I put in are less than KEQ, it means that the bottom of this fraction, either the top of this fraction is too small or the bottom of this fraction is too big. Either way, it kind of means the same thing. If the top of the fraction is too small, it means there's not enough products. And if the bottom of this fraction is too big, it means there's too many reactants. Either way, what the reaction has to do to regain equilibrium is turn some of the reactants, some of the bottom of the fraction, into some products, which is the top of the fraction. That will make the overall value of this fraction bigger and it will eventually get to KEQ. So Q is less than KEQ. This means Either way, the way that this is solved is by the equilibrium shifting to the right to use up some reactants and produce more products. Um, if we had, uh, just for argument's sake, if we had found the opposite situation, that Q was bigger than KEQ, that would mean that the fraction was top heavy, that there were too many products or not enough reactants. And in that case, Q being bigger than KEQ, the way that that would be solved would be to use up some product and turn it back into reactants. So the reverse reaction would be favoured. And that would be called the equilibrium shifting to the left.